I would like to introduce you to my favorite writer, Flannery O'Connor. Flannery O'Connor was born on March 25th, which is, yes, the Annunciation. It's also the day that Dante enters his journey for the Divine Comedy that will lead him through hell, up purgatory, and into the beatific vision. And she died on August 3rd, 1964, so a very short life. Uh, I'm actually the same age right now, 39, that O'Connor was when she died. So I guess it's kind of a personally moving <laughs> uh, to think about O'Connor and to think about how much she accomplished by giving her gifts to God and being able to let him use them in her short life. Myself, I discovered O'Connor almost more than 20 years ago. I was 15 years old. And I wanted to be a novelist, but I also wanted to be a strong Christian and be able to show my faith through my art. And Flannery shows that well. She always uh, would contradict people who said because she's a Catholic, she can't be an artist by saying, well, it's because I'm a Catholic that I have to be an artist. And I think we see that in her work. She is often called a, a little bit of an odd bird, and you see her there holding a bird when she is five years old. She talks about in the King of the Birds essay she wrote, which is in Mystery and Manners, how the Pathé News Company came out to watch her chicken walk backwards, and that for her was a secret to success. You see the chicken is wearing clothes. O'Connor would sew and dress up her chickens, but not until she found her peacocks did she really find uh, the animals that helped her celebrate what she loved about life. And uh, you get to see the map of the universe in their tales, as she says in The Displaced Person and also in that essay. You see a picture of Flannery there reading. She was a precocious child who always enjoyed stories and was really drawn, she said, to Edgar Allan Poe's humorous tales. She said, I always had that look about me, leave me alone or I'll bite you. And if you've read A Temple of the Holy Ghost, which I hope to talk about at some point, and I enjoy teaching, you see a 12-year-old that is very similar to Flannery O'Connor, in which she seems to put a lot of herself in the story. She was raised originally in Savannah until she was about six or seven years old, and that's where she first met and encountered the Catholic Church, which was in the same square as the house that you see pictured here, where she was born and uh, really did not recognize herself as a minority within the majority of the Protestant uh, Georgia, the country that she was surrounded by. But they did move to Milledgeville um, when she was about 15 years old. Her father was suffering from lupus, and when he passed away when she was only 16, this of course left a mark on her more than she realized because she herself would uh, pass away from lupus years later. and. Um, but at this time, she was attending the Peabody School there in Milledgeville. She said that she had the gift of non-retention so that her education was not a burden to her. She was at a progressive school that really didn't treat education well, that didn't educate her, I think, the way that she would have wanted to be educated. <laughs> uh, she went from the Peabody School to the Iowa Writers Workshop, and she was there as a very young student. If you look at her age, she was there from... Uh, about 20 years old to 22 years old. When she got there, she read, again, just voraciously all the things that her progressive high school had not given her an opportunity to study. So she read Kafka and Dostoevsky. If you read her prayer journal, she's quoting Blois, Leon Blois. Uh, she was able to write there and really experience the creative writing life, whereas before she had been a journalist in high school and she actually applied to Iowa Writers Workshop as a journalist student and then decided to move into short stories, which were her art that she really dominated for the rest of her life. She did write two novels, but it's her short stories where she shows a mastery. And in these classes, they would have these guest teachers come in who would always pick O'Connor's story to celebrate and read aloud to the rest of the class as an example. So she became well known among her classmates as kind of the, the prize student, the ex example student in that group. After she left there, she went to Yaddo for a short time and was a, a, around all these celebrated writers. It was a very different life than she had been accustomed to in the South and in Georgia. A really cultured life. She was able to live in a New York apartment for a little while, and then she moved in with the Fitzgeralds and became part of their family. Uh, one of the famous stories is that Robert Fitzgerald was actually translating Oedipus Rex when O'Connor was writing Wise Blood and that influenced her creation of the character who singes out his eyes in order to have 
spiritual sight. But she began to suffer the effects of lupus, which at the time she thought was rheumatoid arthritis. And so in 1952, she returns home by train and in a famous story from her biographers, her uncle didn't even recognize her because in just a few months, she had actually aged what looked like a decade of time. And so she was very much suffering from the disease that would later take her life, but at that point um, was a disease that at least debilitated her and she was forced to stay at home. Um, but it was those limitations, I think, that we see in her work that taught her what it means to be a human being because we all have these limitations and they all show up in different ways. Her stories are known as being scandalous, but I think we need to reconsider what that word means. She's not writing scandalous poetry like Allen Ginsberg or something that's going to scandalize us with its violence like Kurt Vonnegut. She's writing scandalous in the sense of the way the New Testament writers use it as uh, it will be an offense to those who do not believe and that it can make you stumble right, to a scandal, a stumbling block. And her work will make you stumble because if you are inhabiting this world in which you think you're walking right side up, she will show you you're actually walking upside down. And that's what will scandalize readers. And so that's what she's trying to do in her scandalous stories. But it is very off-putting. And a lot of people read A Good Man is Hard to Find and read uh, stories like Greenleaf and then they don't want to read anymore. So you have you know, the example of the violence in Greenleaf where a woman gets gored by a bull. And hopefully we'll get to talk about that story. And the violence becomes the end for most people. It is the horror. But Flannery would say you have hold of the wrong horror. The horror is not the violence. Violence is. It's part of the world that we experience. Yes, you are rightly horrified at news stories that show violence. But in a story, it's not the violence that horrifies you in Flannery's work. It's the fact that through the horror, God can still move to be redemptive. Through something as horrific as a crucifixion, God can move through for redemption. So we shouldn't stop in Flannery O'Connor's world to see violence as an end in and of itself. It's not an end. It is merely a means, and it's not even O'Connor using that means. She then is working for the sake of her characters towards this redemptive moment, the moment of grace as she writes about it in uh, letters and essays. But in her world, she's describing the violent world, and yet she's showing that there are possibilities for something beyond it. And I think that's really important to remember, that she is not celebrating the violence. She's not seeing it as an end. She's not being nihilistic with the violence. These are not Tarantino films where she's glorifying the violence. The violence is the world around her, and she's trying to show how even through such violence, there can be hope and there can be grace. And the grace is the important part of the story. O'Connor is a Christian writer. A lot of Protestants, I've taught at a lot of Protestant universities, hesitate because she's Catholic. Is there something there, you know, that we should be afraid of? And uh, how do we trust her that she's, you know, on the same side as us, is that she's within the same church body as Protestant readers? But she is. She was reading the scriptures. She was reading the Bible, and she was rewriting Bible stories. So you see in her work, you know, the misfit in A Good Man is Hard to Find, and he speaks the truth in the same way that in the Gospel of Mark, the demons are the ones who identify Christ. And she said, if it was good enough for the Gospels, she's going to imitate that in her own stories. And she does that quite commonly. She's rewriting the truth of these biblical stories with her 20th century interpretation of the stories, setting them in the South, writing them, you know, writing the character of Job into Mrs. Turpin and helping us become defamiliarized with the scripture stories that have become so familiar to us so that we can understand them in a new way in these settings and in these places that the Bible is a living word that can be breathed into over and over again with new life and new perspective through fiction, and fiction really can do that for us, and Flannery's especially. A lot of people criticize Flannery because she's writing these grotesque narratives, but for someone who the Bible was so important, right, the Word of God, the incarnation was what she was wanting to point people towards when she's using these grotesque caricatures. She's emphasizing the body in a way that makes our neo manichaean or Gnostic world very uncomfortable. We either want to shun the body or we want to focus so much on the body through our workouts and controlling it or the chemicals that we put into it or the medicines that we take. And um, the body is something that we have to 
almost destroy or harness or overcome. And it's the spiritual that we, we want to be mindful. We want to be spiritually contemplative apart from our body. We want to imagine ourselves as uh, Romano Guardini talks about that uh, the soul is in the body like a man is just want, walking through a house. But that's not true. For O'Connor, she believed that the physical world was inhabited <laughs> with significance that went beyond what we superficially see. And when it comes to the human being, we are in flushed souls. And this is her sacramental imagination. This is the idea that uh, these things can be vehicles of grace, that the body itself can be recipient of grace. And so in her world, you, you commonly see these kind of movements, these gestures, a good man is hard to find. You have the um, ascent in which the grandmother begins on high and then she descends because she has to learn to be humble and low. You have characters who literally say something like for Christ's sake in the river, but spiritually means for Christ's sake. And we have to pay attention to every word in O'Connor because it's pointing us that direction. We never can take the meaning apart from the words, but we go through the words as our vehicles and agents of grace that we can discover the spiritual within them, not to detract and say literal from spiritual, but these, these things are one thing. It's a, a both and scenario in which the words and the spirit are together, just as they are in the incarnation, that Christ is both God and man, not just God and not just man. I hope that you get a chance to read all of Flannery's work. As I've told people many times, and I'm going to continue saying it so that people actually believe me, um, if you get a collection of her complete stories, please start at the back at Revelation and then work your way forward if that's how you're going to read her. You don't have to read her essays and her letters in order to get a sense of how to read her stories. You just have to read her stories multiple times, and I don't think you can just read O'Connor one time and be done with it. You see these illustrations, which come from a website about just Flannery O'Connor portraits. So I want to give credit so you go look for the wonderful artists that have done these works. But Flannery is someone that starts to become written into your imagination. And the more that you get a sense of what she's doing, the more that you read her and not just read one story and take it apart and leave it behind, um, but that you really dig into it, she will begin to shape your imagination, hopefully towards holiness, which was her goal. She used to say, you write a book and then you give it to God. And when it's in his hands, he takes and does with it what he wants. That's the goal of reading Flannery O'Connor's work is to, to read it with that same kind of humble freedom, that, that sense of, I'm going to read this and let God do with this story what he can do in my life. So enjoy some time reading Flannery O'Connor.